Hey, you're listening to the Extra Spicy Podcast. I'm Salejo. And I'm Justin Phillips. On this show, we talk about food and what it all means by speaking with people in the Bay Area and beyond who are writing and thinking about how what we eat shapes us and connects us. On this episode, we speak with Anthony Strong, chef and owner of Prairie in San Francisco's Mission District. We're known for doing everything that we can to give everybody this amazing experience, almost almost to like our own detriment at times. So during the pandemic, he has transformed and reimagined the way Prairie operates, going from this cool kind of live fire restaurant to a convenience store. I guess you could say he was one of like the first kind of upscale places in the city to completely stop traditional service formats and put in place instead like this convenience store, grocery, neighborhood market where you can get meal kits. A lot of places followed, but Anthony was one of those early adopters of this practice. I've actually been to Prairie too. And, you know, it's so interesting to see what he's done with the space. And, you know, it's a good place to get toilet paper these days. I love it. Anthony was actually at his restaurant working as per usual, so that's why uh, you might hear a couple of things in the background. So let's go to the interview. I feel like there's a hundred things to talk about, but give me an idea of how Prairie is transformed during the pandemic. You know, we we basically um, converted it into a general store about two days before shelter in place went into effect in March. It's, it's kind of nuts how it came about. We, uh, we were planning this small upgrade to the space to put in a, a semi-private room to host um, nightly family-style dinners off of our charcoal grills. And we, we did that, you know, we shut down for four days at the end of February to do that small renovation, hammered it out as fast as we could. And it, it, it was while we were like literally doing the construction for that, that we had this moment where we were like, oh, huh, it's getting real over in Wuhan right now. Like, I wonder what what's going to happen to our family style dinners with strangers component <laughs> that, we're, that we're putting together <laughs> if this hits the States. And, you know, it was a bit of like a, oh, yeah, yeah, har har moment at, at the time. And then I started to think pretty seriously about it. You know, we spent a little bit of money on the upgrade. I didn't have as much of a cushion um, and and needed to get a plan together and put my head down and started to think about what people might be might be needing, started to watch what was happening outside of the country. And we, we figured, you know, we figured people wouldn't be needing a, a restaurant and a, and a dining room possibly as much in the future and and that um, what we were providing would need to, to change to fit their needs. And if that was going to be toilet paper and hand sanitizer and cans of beans and tinned fish, um, then, then we could absolutely do that and would be thrilled for the opportunity to, to change and provide for the community like that. So instead of boarding up, we saw our reservations just completely plummet the first week of March. And uh, I was putting my head down trying to find out what dried pastas to get and pasta sauces. Dude, I've never bought pasta sauce in my life. And now, <laughs> now I geek out on, you know, Lydia's chunky eggplant sauce. <laughs> I was like, we started getting in all these things I'd never purchased before, you know? Um, yeah. and, and, uh, and, and started selling them. You know, we put on an online store because um, I wanted it to be, safe for our employees and at this point we don't even allow anybody in the store it's all online orders or you can walk up to the window but so far it's been keeping us afloat we've been able to retain two-thirds of the staff and keep you know some of our bills paid so i'm really glad you did this interview with anthony because you know during the early days of the pandemic i would watch the videos that he posted on instagram from prairie of him like giving us a tour through the restaurant, showing us like, here's how you order. Here's the paper you write the thing on. Um, You know, here's everybody in their PPE. And here's how many people are allowed in the space. Like at the beginning when everything was sort of like anarchy, right? And like, it felt like the the very like tense prelude to like Dawn of the Dead or something. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Him like patiently explaining like what the rules of engagement were in his space was so soothing. I don't know if you felt that but for me that was like oh okay thank you someone is thinking about this 
Right. Well, I mean, it's uh, unpredictable times finds us falling in love with someone who's in control of the space. Right. I know. Like, it's kind of fascist, huh? Isn't it really? Like, <laughs> <laughs> oh, like, ooh, man. yeah. Give me some yeah. more rules. Yeah. Tell me where to go. This is perfect. Oh, I can't walk here. That's good. <laughs> I mean, look, I feel like these restaurants that are really or these uh, food spaces that are really in control of, you know, where you can go, what you can do. Um, are doing what's best for the consumer, even if they don't think it's what's best for them in the moment. Yes. I mean, again, big daddy, right? (laughs) 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 I just need like pasta father to tell me where to stand. Yeah. Who I can talk to or not talk to. Because right now, like, (laughs) there's nothing. Yeah. Pasta father. Yeah. We just need direction. And I, you know, you, you described it as soothing at one point. And um, it's hard to find things that make us feel at peace right now. It might be, it might be weird stuff you see, but um, but I think it's really interesting that you found the video soothing, and I think that speaks a lot to someone, uh, to like who Anthony is as a person. I think like he doesn't, he he isn't like a panicky guy. He like, you know, he really tries to center himself. He th- he's really thoughtful. And actually, what's interesting is that I I did go to Prairie like actually to buy groceries once and you know weirdly like in in the course of my normal life right I don't usually use my name but in this case I just did right to put down my pre-order I wanted like some vegetables and some mayonnaise whatever and you know it was so it was nice you just like pick the thing and we showed up and Anthony came out and was just like are we being reviewed like what's happening (laughs) (laughs) oh my god (laughs) and I was like literally I am just a human um, yeah. showing up, I need mayonnaise. And he was like, all right, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> but like, I, I love the procedure. You know, like sometimes you'll show up to a, a restaurant and or whatever, some business, and they're just like, yeah, come in, whatever. And right, it's just like, right. for some reason, that's so scary right yeah. now. Yeah, no, I, I, I completely agree. I've been out in wine country before before the, you know, the, the state shut things down. I was out in wine country when beer gardens were open and stuff. And uh, I think the only time I got ordered around was when it came to a line. They were like, oh, hey, uh, the line actually starts right here. And then most of the people in that line, like, weren't mer- wearing masks and stuff. And I was just like, man, this this is not the way I'm trying to live. Or at least attempt <laughs> to live, you know? <laughs> no, not at all. Um, so, I mean, I think that's kind of why prairie as it is has been so successful too it's just like they have a handle on things you know they're paying attention i think they realize that all customers want is like efficiency and as little options and confusion as possible um i think that's the key to its success a neighborhood restaurant is supposed to be one of those places that caters to the neighborhood right like you have your regulars and people that you know personally And um, you were one of the first places to switch over to doing like the general store marketplace. What was that first week like? Yeah, the first week was a trip, man. After playing restaurant for so long and after seeing, you know, seeing people come in and order things that, you know, they might have heard about that are on the menu and go through that experience. And, you know, people are taking a picture of their food and might yelp about it and, you know, you know, you you see them again. And after doing that for so long, it was actually amazing to see like people light up that they could get their hands on canned sardines and paper towels. It was such a simple, but like heartwarming thing to be able to do, man. You know, like when people are just like, can we buy some flour off of you? And I was like, oh yeah, you guys need flour? Like we can get flour, we can get 50 pound bags. We just, you know, <laughs> nothing fancy, but we can get good flour and rebag it into, you know, four pound bags. And people were so thrilled. And, and it's been amazing to, to be able to provide this in so many ways, much simpler, simpler thing. But yeah, in that first week, it was kind of going off and people were really stocking up, like really stocking up. And at one point, uh, I, I remember on like that first uh, Friday, we had 
like a, a giant order of, you know, dried pasta, <laughs> sauce, tinned fish, and olive oil, and all these things showing up. And I was literally on the phone with the vendor as the product was being delivered to try and get a second round of the same order out. And meanwhile, just trying to figure out, you know, how to play grocer for the first time ever. I've never done this. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I just love to see the transformation because it, you know, it was what people needed in the moment. And I've always been curious with you having the normal chef experience stripped from you. Did it remind you, like, did it take you back to the beginning of why you got into this stuff in the first place? Yeah, that like, that, that like spoke to my chef heart. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Chef heart. yeah, man, absolutely. Our, our role is to give hospitality to people. And I got into this because I love cooking for people and I love doing things for people. This entire time we've been able to get get things people need in the neighborhood <laughs> and 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 keep our keep our employees on on the payroll and and take care of the vendors that you know farmers and whatnot that we've been using for that I've been using for over a decade here in the Bay Area and so like being able to continue my role and being a part of that ecosystem has just really gotten me back to to why I do this to begin with the second component I still get to geek out on food, man. Like, <laughs> it's just a lot different now. I, I'm, now I'm finding myself, you know, nerding out on, on totally different things. Uh, we got this like mochi spaghetti in that is just awesome. That I, I, I never dreamt I would be playing with. I'm so excited about, you know. So there's still room to explore even during all of this. Totally. I've never run an online store, never run a grocery store before. Um, <laughs> so I kind of don't really know the rules. And I've been writing the descriptions on our online Square site, for instance. <laughs> and I was like, wow, descriptions on websites for product are so dry. You know, <laughs> it's just like, wow. So our team really geeks out on the descriptions. Like we have this Yuzu Shichimi that we get in. And I think our description right now says, if there is a God, this is the lemon pepper spice she puts on like everything. <laughs> to, you, to 20 gram packet, you know? <laughs> I love everything about that. That's, that's amazing. I know things are so serious now. So a big part of, you know, our motivation is at least to get people a good chuckle in a can of beans. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, that's all you can ask for. I just need to like geek out a little bit at this part because as an ex-copywriter, I really appreciate when people highlight the unseen labor of writing <laughs> the descriptions underneath like product headlines. It's really important work yeah. and kind of soul crushing. <laughs> when Anthony was discussing it, I was just like, oh, that's interesting. But knowing that you did it, I, I got I to gotta hear more about this. <laughs> So, yeah, when I was in grad school, I worked part time as a copywriter and I would literally do the little product descriptions for online catalogs for knives, um, <laughs> wow. picnic baskets and bird feeders. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. And like, you know, the knife, dem you have to like really study up your demographic, right? Like who is buying a knife right now? Who wants <laughs> right. a katana yeah, right yeah. now? Um, <laughs> and what will make them want to buy this katana? At the same time, you, you legally cannot write about... Um, killing people with the knife you can't so, you can't use murder it really you can't, limits your creativity you can't use murder words and all of this like, no murder words oh wow no slaughter no nothing um <laughs> so, <laughs> you know you'd have to highlight like the kind of steel that is used the materials um and geek out about like full tang versus half tang knives you know like what is that you have to oh, learn what that interesting. is interesting it's like mattress shopping you know you have to become an expert in it and only insofar as like when you need to do the shopping and then the rest of your life, you don't have to care. <laughs> yeah, no, it was super fun. And there's so much space to do like weird stuff, like Anthony's saying. Um, when you control the company or whatever, uh, you can be as silly as you want. You know, I think we often see online, like, I think we share around sometimes like some really weird product descriptions. Yeah. Like that's a genre unto itself nowadays. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, and yeah, there is a human writing those usually, right? And right. you can tell when it's an algorithm, but like usually a human does it and really tries to express some like poetic feeling through it so that it <laughs> sticks in your mind and makes you want to buy the thing. <laughs> you know? I mean, it kind of it kind of reminds you that, you know, for Anthony specifically at at, at Prairie, like the pivot of turning a restaurant into like a, a market kind of grocery store is a hard thing to do. Like it's it's not just moving a couple of tables aside and selling a couple of different things. Like you, it's work. Like it, there's a level to it that I, I copywriting never would have crossed my mind. Never. Yeah, you got to put on a different hat. Got to put on a bunch of hats. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And and that's the thing too, which I think is great, is that. When you are a cook or, you know, a food person, um, you'd have these deep thoughts about ingredients. You know, you have things to say about carrots that I think will infuse the descriptions with a lot more soul. Um, I think that's really cool. You are listening to the Extra Spicy Podcast. We will be right back after the break. I'm Justin Phillips, and I'm back with Anthony Strong, chef and owner of Prairie, a uh, restaurant turned convenience store in San Francisco's Mission District. Um, let's get back to the interview. So, Anthony, man, I, I wrote this story recently about uh, like the delivery apps, and then the 30% commission fees they were charging. Then San Francisco put it and put that cap in place. They put the cap at 15. A couple of apps are still charging over 15. And that's brutal during a pandemic when, you know, nobody's making any money. But you've taken a different approach to that whole concept. Like, what are you doing so, so where you don't have to rely on those apps? Yeah, well, I mean, it was uh, those cuts were brutal before the pandemic, too. And and. And knowing that, you know, I knew from the start that we would want to be doing our own delivery to some capacity here. Before getting this restaurant space, I ran an experimental ghost kitchen. I think it was it was one of the first standalone concepts built off of third party. I was super interested in the opportunity in that space because it hadn't seen a concept that was isolated to work off of just that. And, you know, I... I I quickly realized that a I liked <laughs> I liked cooking for people and seeing them, <laughs> um, so, <laughs> and 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 kind of needed that. And um, and b the margins weren't great. And working off of a non hospitality company to provide hospitality is a challenging um, setup. So what what we've done here is we just do delivery for baskets over a hundred bucks. And we deliver seven days a week here in the city and twice a week down the peninsula. Um, we want to do East Bay. We're looking for, you know, once we can get enough requests to do it in the East Bay, we will. We do it with the, with, with the restaurant's Volkswagen. <laughs> and, and our line cooks deliver and our manager delivers and, and I deliver. And we have a, you know, we have a kit of Clorox wipes and gloves and masks and paper towels. And we, and we, and we hammer it all out on Google Maps and put a route together every day. And um, it's definitely the scrappy version of it. But at least people know that when they when they buy stuff from us and, and they're getting it delivered, that all of it's going right back to a small, independently owned restaurant that's just, you know, struggling for survival and, and hustling it out themselves. Hopefully, hopefully that part resonates with people especially right now given how vulnerable our industry is it's more important than ever for if people want to support restaurants to to do it in the right way and think about where those dollars are being spent you know if you if you use a, a, a delivery app you know it, it might be very it might be a bit more convenient than picking up the phone and, and calling the, the sushi place but at the end of the day it, you know you if you pick up the phone and order from the sushi place and you go out and get some fresh air and pick up from them. The full dollar goes to goes to that local business. The important thing is too is like that full dollar. Ninety five percent of that in the restaurant business goes goes right into the local economy. Those are local, you know, vendors, people that are working, living in the community. And so I, I think we have an opportunity to hopefully rethink um, the the ethics around third party delivery. How is how does third party delivery like 
like what's its impact on society basically like the like dining culture what is it adding what is it removing i guess is the better question well i mean i, I think that what it you know what it adds is is definitely convenience and accessibility and ease of function right and what it adds is is time for people you know in a way it's like i can order food quickly keep my head down in my work or stay with my family at home and the thing just shows up ready to go right there's like an ease of use appeal that i that i that i totally get i just i think what it does to the um the cultural fabric of of cities is the thing that we have to take into consideration restaurants you know are pre-pandemic we're barely getting by you know and and we're oftentimes grasping at, de at delivery as an opportunity that was almost like fake in a lot of ways it's like it's something that you jump at the opportunity to do because you want to see the increase in revenue but meanwhile you see your margins shrink and then you see people going out less and then you see it become harder to survive as a small independent business so i think we really need to think about those kinds of things moving forward. So yeah, eating out right now is so dramatic. There's so much going on. There's so much like weight on your choices as a consumer. You know, I get asked this all the time by diners and also like in interviews that I do is like, how can we support restaurants? And even like the, the delivery apps, right? They're using that phrasing of like, support your local restaurant, order from DoorDash now. You know, it's like, a part of the lexicon and there's no you know since the beginning of uh shelter in place like the those third-party apps kind of made a killing because there was no other option for restaurants like they had to go to delivery or takeout so if they weren't signed up for grubhub doordash uber eats um anything like that they had to sign up for it just to maintain business and see and the the interesting thing about this is that you know, in the very beginning, when people were trying to figure out how to help restaurants, the easiest thing for them to do was to go to those apps and be like, well, I don't feel like going out. I'm just going to get them to deliver it. Right. But what was killing those restaurants was the commission fees tied to them using those apps. So like a restaurant has to pay a 30 percent commission fee to DoorDash or Grubhub whenever like an order is completed or 30 percent of the order. And that's a chunk of money at a time when there aren't many revenue streams coming into the business. So it's like you are you want to support in some way, but using those third-party apps was like suffocating them. Yeah, I think people are hyper aware of those commission fees now. And I know you've been writing about them a lot too. And I get like Instagram DMs from restaurateurs who are just like, hey, I got yeah. this email from DoorDash. Is this like legal? <laughs> and then I send them on to you. <laughs> um, that's basically yeah. how news works, by the way. Yeah, that's it. That's that's peeking behind the curtain, people. <laughs> but yeah, like what's with all this confusion and like what should people who are not restaurateurs, like people who just want to eat, um, what should they take away from all this? You know, I, I th okay, so let's start with the restaurateurs, I think. Um, in San Francisco, like in April, I wrote this thing about how uh, just chefs in the Bay Area were struggling with commission fees. Like, you know, it's just really expensive to do business with these apps. So then San Francisco put a cap in place where so the commission fees for most of those uh, most of those platforms can range from like 10 to 30 percent. And then um, and usually the places that sign up to those platforms later usually get charged 30 percent. And just like a note, like 30 percent, 25 to 35 percent of a total cost of like a, a menu item like a, a plate of fries right right that's how much the ingredients should cost right ideally yeah. so like that on top of that food cost on top of labor and rent and all that stuff that's baked into the price it's a lot that's a really that's a really really good point so san francisco was like all right we're gonna cap these that 30 percent we're gonna make we're gonna make it fifteen percent. That's the cap. You know these apps can't charge you more than fifteen percent. But you know, as with any kind of legislation, I think there was kind of like some vagueness in the language about when it would start and when it would stop. And so in June, um, there were a couple of apps that were like, "Oh, so that cap has ended. We're gonna hike the commission fees for these restaurants back up to thirty percent," which wasn't the case. Like they should have been operating at underneath that cap that whole time. And I think there was some confusion there, right? And also, like a lot of these, uh, you know, if you look at like DoorDash or Uber Eats, a lot of their uh, 
I, I think the way that their contracts are done or how the, the restaurants work with these companies, like it, there's a lot of automation. So, you know, they'll get a, a, a bill printed out that shows a 30% commission rate when it should be 15%, then they have to go dispute that and see if they were charged that. So there's just a lot of confusion on that end. Oh, that's a pain in the ass. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's it's ridiculous. And so for diners, what diners should know um, is just how painful working with those apps can be. In no way will I ever discourage anyone right now from supporting their 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 local restaurant, their neighborhood restaurant, their favorite spot, any restaurant in general. Like there's a place that you like, you know, go for it. I'm not going to tell people not to do that, but you should be cognizant of the struggles that these restaurants have with these apps. Like they're, you know, they have no choice right now, you know, like they have to work with them for the most part, but, 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 but if it is possible um, for you to go to that place and, and get the food, then do that. Or if you have, if a restaurant has its own kind of delivery system set up, you know, lean into that. That's not that bad. That would be my advice. Yeah, that's a hard thing, right? Because I know that a lot of restaurants that can't afford PR, for instance, or, you know, they don't have the time to be on Instagram and learn all that stuff. Um, these apps are one of the only ways for them to get their names out there because, you know, you're jockeying for attention right. right now, especially because people have only so much money right now because a lot of people have either reduced work hours or, you know, like something is messed up with their finances and um, you need every order you can get because I'm sure a lot of these places are not in the black right now. Yeah. Oh, for sure. And, you know, and that was what that's a really good point. That was one of the other things is that, like, you know, some of these apps would be like, you know, part, you know, some of the fees that we give you are to do marketing for you. And like right now, right. you know, that's that just goes that just goes back to saying like they it's really tough right now because they a lot of these places don't have a choice. Like they just have to kind of bite the bullet and go for it and work with these platforms, even if they wouldn't have, you know, before. And it's just tough, man. Like it's, you know. It's tough. It's tough for them to find comfort in these things because, you know, the apps know that they're needed. It's just tough. Yeah. It's kind of like, you know, any leap in technology. I think about this with movies a lot and like TV where like yeah. if a movie didn't make the leap from VHS to DVD, like we really don't have much of a way of watching it right. anymore, right? Right. And then if they didn't make the leap to streaming, like if a movie isn't on Netflix, does it exist? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So like if a restaurant isn't on DoorDash, like what, why would we go through the trouble of looking for it when there's another perfectly like serviceable restaurant that's just like it on that service? Yeah, you're absolutely right. See, for, so for people who want to search for, who are like, you know, I want to, I, I want to support local restaurants. I want to support my neighborhood spot. Like it might take a little bit of work. You know, you might not be able just to have to pull up DoorDash. Maybe on a walk, you'll have to spot a place. Like, it might it might take a little bit of work, you know? I mean, it's the same amount of work that it would take me to dig through, like, the boxes in my parents' attic and <laughs> and, fi and find some old VHS movies. Now, now that you mentioned VHS movies, now I'm thinking about it. I know they got some. I have one. What's that? It's the VHS of Jim Cotta. <laughs> which is this movie is <laughs> a martial arts movie that combines gymnastics and karate oh man that's the only one i have throwback that definitely didn't make it to dvd that's like that's why i'm thinking about it like it's not you can't stream it anywhere <laughs> that's why i have the vhs oh my god yeah so i mean it'll take a little bit of work you know, you just if you're a diner you have to be aware of what these apps are doing to you know how restaurants are getting squeezed um still support maybe do the extra legwork to to find a a restaurant that didn't transition from VHS to 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 Netflix kind of thing and uh and go from there we've already been through so much stuff that was unprecedented it's hard to see what's down the line but at the same time you have to exist outside of your restaurant so what is what is life like for a chef who you know, is under the same restrictions. Like you can't go explore other restaurants if you're curious about them. Um, you know, you have to like shelter in place as well. Like what's, you know, what's home life like? What's life like outside of the kitchen? How do you stay sane? <laughs> well, you know, what's weird is I actually have one now. 
like <laughs> the silver lining to this whole <laughs> damn crazy thing. Uh, my girlfriend and I have had dinner for like 95 out of the past 100 nights. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> like I think our previous record was probably like, you know, two nights a week. <laughs> in a restaurant you know i'm always in dinner service and and um and, and so that that's actually been amazing we have we like i feel normal like the weird thing for me man is i feel like some semblance of normal that i'd imagine touches on what non-restaurant industry people have like we have a refrigerator that's marked up with our menu for the week <laughs> and i'm like cooking for two <laughs> that's so cool you know that's so amazing. it's actually gotten me it's 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 gotten me you know spending a little bit of time at home i also say that it, it's just you know it, having to wrap my head around the challenges of figuring this out and using using very very they're very different challenges <laughs> than i've been used to mm -hmm. and it's been it's been rewarding and a good exercise but also just like brutal so yeah you know i'm like literally every second that i'm not here and or working on restaurant stuff at, at home you know meditating or sticking to a just like very regimented morning routine or going on long bike rides or you know doing yoga at home just to try and keep some semblance of uh of sanity <laughs> yeah you think a lot of chefs are kind of like is this a chance to step back and be like you know holy shit i can have dinner with my family now i can like focus on it everything sucks but at least i can <laughs> build up home life is that you think that's something that the industry is starting to you know to enjoy i guess <laughs> definitely you know i think i think it seems like it's like a lot of us are going to be rethinking the role that work plays in our lives moving forward you know we're 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 known for you know doing everything that we can to give everybody this amazing experience almost almost to like our our own detriment at times it's like a masochistic thing at times you know we mm -hmm. work 12 15 hour days in a business with paper thin margins and try to promise you know the world to everybody in a highly competitive highly saturated space i think if it's one thing that this has provided for me and a lot of chefs that i know it's a bit of a a bit of a values reset and like a forced reckoning with 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 what this means to us where we should be applying our attention after getting i will tell you one thing after getting people cans of beans and flour and hearing them ecstatic about it i, I would at this point i definitely know i never want like a super fancy fussy restaurant <laughs> you know this is like such a purity in that exchange that Oh, it's, it's pretty important to me. So now we're on to some weird stuff. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what is this nonsense, which is our crown jewel? This is like our segment to shine with all of our like <laughs> stupidity. Um, <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, no, I think there's a lot to say. A there's, lot of nonsense in the world. There's so much nonsense. I think I'm going to... I'm just gonna dive into one real quick. Yeah, yeah, quick. please start. I don't know if we're we're like showing our age at this point, <laughs> but I'm about to bring up. So there's a rapper uh, named Ja Rule, and if that if that guy sounds familiar to any of you listeners out there, then uh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> it, well, if if you know him, um, not apart from Firefest, right? Then we're right. good. Yeah, then we're good, right? So uh, it's funny that you bring up Firefest. So since we're uh, a food-oriented podcast, I suppose, um, he was one of the scammers, scam and go scam, basically. Didn't he say he got scammed? He said he got scammed. Then he tried to scam some other thing after that. <laughs> and like he was trying to like, I can't remember what. I don't know if it was to do with the credit card or whatever. Either way, the details don't matter when it comes to jaw rule. Outside of that, so. Recently, Ja Rule had like a commercial 
um, that went viral for this Greek restaurant uh, in L in Los Angeles uh, called Papa Christos, I think. Papa Christos got the best motherfucking gyros, gyros you ever ate your life. So I mean, it's basically him in front of like a green screen where he's like. <laughs> So like public access level. Oh, very much so. And it's like almost like clip art that's basically behind them. And he's saying, oh, God. And he's just talking about how like it's the best restaurant ever, basically. And he's that's jumping cute, around. Though. And he has a shirt on that says, I love Greece. And it's just like super that's low so budget. Cute. The reason it is, yeah, I guess so. Like from from an, from the outside, it is cute. But the thing is, like Ja Rule's fresh off that fire festival thing. So everyone's like, oh man, like <laughs> laughing about it. Like, oh, he's going broke and he's doing all this. <laughs> now look at him like, oh, what a bummer. And I laughed about it too. Like I was joking about it with my brothers and like text messages and stuff. Then come to find out that it's like, so it's part of this TV show um, where they like make commercials for small businesses that might be suffering during the pandemic. I think it's something Ja Rule pitched. Once again, the details don't really matter with Ja Rule. <laughs> but what I enjoy, what I thought was kind of nice, like, even if that commercial sucks, and even if Ja Rule is just like, God, what an idiot. Still, that's people knowing who, who Papa Christos is, right? And if, like, other celebrities do that, that would be kind of neat. That's really sweet. Yeah, I thought it was pretty nice. Anyway, that was a whole lot of hating on Ja Rule just to be like, he aight, bro. <laughs> <laughs> He's not so bad after all. Yeah. Um, so what do you got? Okay. So it's a game that I became kind of like super, well, not kind of like super, like, you know, I, I just became so into over the past weekend. Video game? Oh, yeah. It's called Hot Pot Panic. And it's made by Keen Ng, who is a San Francisco native, I think. Um, and this is a game about making hot pot, like cook, like putting meat and tofu and shiitake mushrooms into a pot um, while listening to your friend who's sitting across from you, like <laughs> just talk about the most banal shit um, while you're trying to stuff yourself. And like, that's the game. That's it. I mean, it's so tense. It's so gripping. It's so great. And it's also extremely real. <laughs> Cause right, it's like, why do you is. go to hot pot? Do you go to listen to somebody or do you go to eat? But then it's that constant, like, looking down, looking up, being like, oh, my God, what did I miss? Yeah. And it's just so funny. Like, you know, no matter when it came out, I feel like the stress associated with playing that would have been nothing compared to, like, now, mm -hmm. where we can't even go to Hot Pot anymore. And just, you know how you remember the extremes of things when you don't have access to them? Like, food <laughs> tastes better when you don't, your favorite food tastes better when you don't get to eat it? Like, I imagine I would be extra stressed out now just thinking of, like, trying to carry on a conversation at a hot pot restaurant. Mm hmm That's Yeah. That's so funny. You know, it's like a poem or something that expresses, like, a very singular, like, moment that everyone experiences. Yep. yep. You know, it, it is that. It is so simple. Anyone who goes to restaurants to eat as opposed to socialize can understand <laughs> I, I go to eat. Yeah. I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to get down to business. You and I have been to dinner, and I don't think we've said one word to each other outside <laughs> of this podcast. <laughs> I I need to play that game either way. That's such a great find. Oh, it's awesome. All right, people. So that's all we have for today's episode. Thanks again to Anthony Strong for being in conversation with me. Uh, you can read the transcript of my full interview with Anthony at sfchronicle.com slash spicy. And please remember to send us any questions or voice memos you might have about food, life, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your they friend, whatever, for our Dear Spicy Advice segment at extra spicy at sfchronicle.com. Thank you for listening. Extra Spicy is part of the San Francisco Chronicle Podcast Network. Erica Carlos is the producer of the show. If you like the Extra Spicy podcast, subscribe on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can find me, Soleil Ho, on Twitter at H-O-O-L-E-I-L. -L. And me, Justin Phillips, at Just Mr. Phillips. You can support Extra Spicy and great journalism by signing up for a San Francisco Chronicle membership at sfchronicle.com slash pod.